usually, um, when I get up here, I'd, I give what I believe God's given me to speak about. And hopefully you derive some benefit from it. But every now and again, <clears throat> there's a message that I think is really, really important. This is one of those messages. Every now and again, there's a message that can fundamentally change your life if you can grasp it. Christianity is so simple, but it's so difficult. The principles are so simple, <clears throat> but being able to take that and walk into an experiential understanding of that is not always the easiest thing. It's a really important thing that we can speak about this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> If you get this, if you get this principle, it'll change your relationship with God. If you get what we speak about this morning, it'll totally transform your life and your world. You will never be the same. I guarantee that. That's how important this one is. I want to speak to you this morning about a subject that I've titled, Passage of Discovery. God spoke to Moses and he said to Moses, I want you to take the children of Israel out of Egypt and I want you to lead them to a place that I will show you. I want you to take them from a place of bondage, from a place where they find themselves right at the moment, and I want you to take them to a promised land that I'm gonna provide for them. I'm gonna provide for them a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm gonna provide for them a provision and a promise above all that they can hope and think. And Moses embarks on this journey and he goes and he gets the children of Israel together and he says, okay, everybody pack up and through a whole series of events, they say, fine, we're leaving Egypt and off we go. So everybody gets ready and they go and they start on this journey and they leave Egypt and they head through the desert and they're heading on the way to the promised land, to what God has promised them. In essence, we find ourselves in a situation where the problem that people were living in, the problem that was there, God has taken them out of that and he's taking them to a place of promise and a place that he wants them to experience fullness of life, fullness of what he has for them. Between the promise and the answer, there is a journey that takes place. Between the, pro between the problem and God's solution and what he wants to walk you into, you're gonna walk through an experience. You're gonna walk through an encounter. You're gonna walk through a passage of discovery. And the passage of discovery is there with intention. Because as you walk through the passage of discovery, there's some things that are going, you are going to learn. You're gonna discover in the passage of discovery how God works. If you don't understand how God works, you're not able to co-labor with him. If you don't understand how God works, you end up frustrated in your Christian walk because you know that there should be more, you know that there should be something better than what I have right now, but you don't know how to realize that. There are principles for the way that God has, is wanting to work with us. There are ways that he has set in motion and look, he's looking for us to operate. And so we need to discover those ways. We need to discover how it is that we interact with God. There is a fundamental and very important concept called faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. Unless you have faith, you will never be at a place where you're able to take the things of God and bring them into an experiential reality. You're gonna discover what faith is all about. You're gonna learn about faith in the passage of discovery. The passage of discovery isn't a place for perfection. The passage of discovery is a place where you will go to where you're gonna fall down and where you're gonna knock yourself. And there are gonna be times of failure and there are gonna be places of trials and there are gonna be places where you wanna give up and there are gonna be places that are difficult. That's part of what it means to learn 
It's part of what it means to grow. It's part of what it means to come to a place where we understand what it is to work with God so that we're able to take his principles and work them out. Don't try to be perfect. There is no one in the Bible who was perfect. There was no one in the Bible who got it right first time and never made mistakes. Part of your Christian walk is about failure. Not supposed to hear that from the pulpit, are you? The pulpit. Part of your Christian walk is failure because you don't know everything. And if you're gonna wait until you understand everything in your head before you do it, it's never gonna work. Because when you start working it out, you're gonna discover just when you thought you had everything figured out here, it doesn't work out here. The Christian walk is all about walking it out. It's about going somewhere with God and it's about learning in that process. If you fail, that's okay. If you fall down, it's okay. You know what? God is faithful. And no matter what happens through the process, through the passage of discovery, he is with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He will show you what happened. He will give you understanding. He will bring you to a place where you recognize what went wrong and we grow in that. It's okay not to be perfect. But when you come out of the passage of discovery, what you discover on the, under, on the, on the other end is gonna be determined by how you walk through that passage. You are going to determine what you discover at the end. Certain people realize the blessings of God and others don't. The children of Israel never walked into the promised land and they died in the wilderness. The decisions you make, your ability to grow, your ability to find your place as a co-laborer with God is going to be defined in the passage of discovery. God came to a man called Abram and he says to Abram, you know what? I like what I see. I'm gonna make you a father of many nations. He was 70 years old, 70 years old. I'm sure Abram was very excited and he was thrilled at what God had said to him. But he thought, God, why couldn't you have met me 50 years ago? Why do you wait until I'm 70? God meets him when he's 70 years old. Do you know when God met him and gave him the promise that he would become a father of many nations, the fulfillment of that promise only came about 30 years later. 30 years. It took 30 years for Abram to walk through the passage of discovery. It took Abram 30 years to discover what it was to walk with God, to understand God, to understand the principles of God, to get to a place 30 years later where he could say, now I'm ready. We take for granted the fact that Abram never had a Bible. He never had any reference material. Abram's discoveries were between him in relationship with God. He didn't have a concept called faith. We read about faith. We go to church and we hear about faith. We read faith in all kinds of books. We listen to it on C. Faith is every. We hear about faith. Faith wasn't something that was rampant at the time. What is faith? Faith is a way of working with God. We give it a label. Put the label aside. What is it about? It's a principle of working with God so that we can understand work with him and bring the promises that he's made available to us so that it becomes an experiential reality in our lives. That's what it is. We just call it faith. He knew God as the author because God came to him and said, this is what I promise you. He knew God as the author of his faith. But it took him 30 years to know God as the finisher of my faith. You see, what God promises you, he's not only giving to you, what he's saying to you is, I'm going to fulfill it. That's where we have the problem. Because we have within us the tendency and the propensity to want to make that happen. 
When God gives us something, the challenge that we have is, we wait for God to do something, we wait for God to do something, and if by breakfast time it hasn't happened, we decide it really would be valuable if we help God out a little bit. <laughs> and because we try to help God out, what do we do? We run out there and we do what we believe we should be doing to try and make it happen, to realize his promise. We put ourselves in a place where we give birth to an Ishmael. God was the author, I was the finisher. When you're the finisher of God's promises in your life, you are gonna give birth to an Ishmael. When you give birth to an Ishmael, it's gonna put you into a place of bondage. There are people who sit and say, God's promised me he's gonna give me a lovely spouse and I'm gonna spend my life with him and then the first woman with a little twinkle in her eye and the first guy that smiles nicely, I've met my soulmate! (laughs) Because my heart is fluttering, I've never felt my heart flutter like it's fluttering right now. It's a flutter I've never felt. (laughs) And I sit down and I, I decide, because they told me in Cosmopolitan that I need to do a pros and cons list. And so I wrote down the pros and I wrote down the cons and two of these cons and eight of these pros, this must be the one, it's a sign. (laughs) And so we run off and we get married and then we hate our lives because it's not what I thought it was gonna be. But I felt really good and it seemed to make sense to me, but I'm miserable and I'm stuck in a situation where I'm bound to it. God says he's gonna bless you, hallelujah. And I run out and I open my company and he said, I never told you to do that. You've just birthed an Ishmael. He was the author but you were the finisher. And you've birthed something that suddenly you're struggling to make happen and it doesn't work and you can't find clients and the money's not there and you're putting, and it's a big bucket with a hole in the bottom. God tells me that he tells you he's gonna heal you. Fine, let's just throw away the medicines. He didn't tell you to do that. You end up in trouble. When you healed, you'll be fine. When you heal, the doctor will say, you know what, you don't need the stuff anymore. But we want to run off and do things. We are well-intentioned, but we take it upon ourselves to initiate stuff. And when we initiate things, what ends up happening is we end up with an Ishmael. Not only does an Ishmael put us in a place of bondage, but an Ishmael will cost you. It'll cost you time, it'll cost you money, it'll cost you resources, it'll cost you peace of mind. It'll cost you happiness. It'll cost you where you are with God. Because there are times where you birth an Ishmael and what ends up happening is you're gonna have to run around a mountain. And sometimes that's a pretty big mountain you gotta run around before you get back to the place where you were with God originally. It'll cost you. But hard part of the difficulty with an Ishmael is that people leave those experiences all too often bewildered and befuddled. I don't understand. God promised me this. I thought this this was the way. How could God do this to me? How could God not provide for me? How come I'm not happy in this situation? How come the marriage is, how come, how, how come? Why? Because God was the author, I was the finisher. I took it upon myself to finish something up and what ended up happening was I created it. God wasn't in the creation of it. But I look at it and I sit and say, because I was well-intentioned, because I tried to do something right, surely it must be right. We create for ourselves Ishmael's, and Ishmael's put us in a bad place. Why don't you turn to Romans chapter 12. I want you to have a look at this in a different light. (coughs) Romans chapter 12 it starts speaking right here and from the, the couple of verses that we're gonna read, it carries on and it speaks about faith and then it keeps getting into giftings. 
Okay, so I want you to understand the context of what he's talking about because it'll help us. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Okay, now stick with me for 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes. This is the most important 10 minutes. The other bit you can, it's a little appendage. This is the most important 10 minutes. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Who is I? It is your personality. I think this, I believe that. I feel this, I have decided that. All of those aspects are you, it's your personality. What God is saying to you is I want you to recognize something now. In the most intimate part of who you are, your heart, not the little ticker, the thing within you that drives your life, I want you to understand the, the, the components within that. I came in and you and I came into relationship and in that place of relationship in your spirit, suddenly you came to life in me. My life is in you. That is where life is. Anything that is outside of that sphere is not part of the arrangement. There is no life in that. In your thinking, in your feeling, in your ideas, in your will, that's you. What he's saying here is this. I want you to understand it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what I decide. The question is, spirit, what do you want to do? Talk to me, Father, because he's going to speak to your spirit. What do you want to do? Well, I don't believe that. It doesn't matter what you believe. You need to say, I subject my beliefs to what he's telling me. But it doesn't make me feel comfortable doing stuff like that. I don't like praise and worship like this. I don't like, it doesn't matter what you feel. If he told you to do it, you sacrifice your feelings, your will, your thought processes. You think you're smarter than God? Well, I just don't think like that. I just don't believe that that's the case. It's because you need to spend more time with God because then you will discover it's the case. The problem is the point that he's saying to you is I want you to understand there comes a place in our lives if you want to change your life where you have to recognize the components of who I am have to subject themselves to the authority of the spirit within me. And he says that is your reasonable service. He doesn't think it's unreasonable. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want you to just listen to two words in there. The, the other stuff goes with it. These are the most important words. Conform, transform. Conform, transform. As human beings, we conform to things all the time. The people that you mix with your social group is going to influence the way you see life, the way you think about things, the way that you feel about things. Watch your kids. Watch what they come home with. We conform to things all the time. In our natural person, we are conformists. That's what we do. I conform to the things that I feel comfortable with, the things that I believe with, the social set that I'm with. I'm a conformer. So what ends up happening is when I get born again, I move into a spiritual environment and if I'm still young, I haven't learned what God is saying to me. So I continue with the way I've always done things and I continue with conformity. So I take who I am and I conform them over here because this is what my church believes and this is what my church says, and this is what my church looks like, and this is how my church prays, and this is how my church does praise and worship, so I conform to all of those things. And when you look at those people, they look so spiritual, and they look so good, and they wear the most wonderful labels, and they're big fish on their car, and they look so good, but they're conformists. 
What they've done is they're trying, I want people to see Jesus in me. He never called you so that people see Jesus in you. You are not called to be like Jesus. What he said is, I want you to step aside so that they see me. But we try and conform to what Jesus is. I try and be good. I try and be the person who's loving. But I can only do that for so long. And then I get impatient. (laughs) But I'm trying really hard. What am I doing? I'm conforming. I'm conforming to what I think I should be as a good Christian. I'm in the process and in the business of conforming. And Jesus says, let's read the verse. I don't want you to conform. I want you to be made New. Why? Because that, what is spirit is life. What is flesh benefits nothing. What he's saying is the life in everything that I have to offer is in the spirit. It's in the spirit. That's where the life is. The challenge is, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take this life, I'm trying to take the promises, I'm trying to take the things that are mine, and I'm trying to give them to you. But I'm putting it into a vessel that's all about conformity. So I hear that God says this to me, and what he does is, he gives me a word, he authors something in my life, and because I'm a conformist, I take that and I try and make that come to pass, because I think I'm doing the right thing for God. And God says, you're making Ishmael's. What he's saying is, the things that are spiritual have to be birthed out of the spirit. And the only way that you can do that is that you have to have spiritual tools to do that. You have to have life to be able to do that. There is no life in you. So God says, I've got a bit of a challenge here. I've got to put some life in you. Because if you got no life, you can't birth it. So he says, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. This is the process I've put in place for you to realize how to work with me. When I take my word, which is my life, and I put it inside of your soul, which is you, the natural man, I'm taking something spiritual and putting it inside a soulish realm. And if you let that grow, what ends up happening, a spiritual entity grows and takes root and begins to grow in your life. And the more that you consider it, and the more that you meditate on it, and the more word that you put into it, the bigger it's gonna grow. And the more that it grows, what ends up happening is it finally reaches a stage where it bears fruit. Something spiritual that's been planted in my soul has grown up and is now delivering fruit. What is the fruit it bears? Faith. Faith. The problem that we have is this. We've always thought God's job is to be the author of promises. My job is to build up confidence and faith in God. That's my job. If I trust God, he will give it to me. If I believe God, he will give it to me. If I have confidence in God, he will give it to me. It's all about me. God saying, faith is not a natural th- substance. It's a spiritual substance. The only way that you can get something spiritual inside something that is soulish or natural is it has to be put in there by God. What he's saying is, If you take my word and you put my word in your soul and you let my word grow up, my word will produce the fruit of faith, which is spiritual. Suddenly you're holding on to faith, a spiritual entity, which puts you at a place where you can work with God and what you can do is you have the ability to all of a sudden take the things of the spirit and usher them into your world. Unless you have that, what ends up happening is we end up as a a, a double-minded person. My soulish realm has difficulty being able to work with God because it kind of believes that as long as things are going well. It kind of believes everything's okay until I hit a hiccup. When I hit a hiccup, then I wonder where God has gone. When I hit a hiccup, I want to run back to Egypt and live off the leeks and the, the onions because I knew that world.
God has a plan for you to receive the promises. And what he's saying is, I need you to be made new. How are you made new? you made new by the seed that is planted within you. It's the seed of the word that's planted in the soil of our hearts. The nature of that soil is evidenced by the degree to which we hear what the Holy Spirit is telling us. The the degree to which we have revelation. There are some people who listen but don't hear. There are some people who know more about the Bible than you do. They can tell you more about the Bible, but they don't hear anything. So there's no hearing. There is no seed that's being deposited in the heart. There's some people who go to different denominations, and what ends up happening is they have selective hearing. I hear the things that God tells me that conforms to whatever my particular denomination believes. But anything that God starts to tell me that is not in line with my denomination, I've already discounted. So I have selective hearing. The degree to which you are able to hear is the degree to which you are able to produce in your life. That you may prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There are degrees of production. The degree to which you are able to hear what God is saying is the degree to which you are able to produce. It's all very well knowing God as the author, but we have got to know God as the finisher. When we walk through the passage of discovery, it shows us how to discover God as the finisher of what he's promised. We're going to learn in that space that there is a process that God goes through. You cannot separate the word from it. If you don't have the word, you cannot have faith. Faith comes by? And hearing? Hearing the word, hearing the word, hearing the word. The more you hear the word, the more you are taking something that is a spiritual entity and you are putting it into your soul. That you are taking care of it, that you are nurturing it, that you are letting it grow, that you are letting it get big. The more you hear the word, the more the word gets inside of you, the bigger it gets and the more robust your faith is going to become. Tell your neighbor this is for them. This is not for you. (laughs) One of the biggest reasons, one of the biggest reasons we struggle to receive from God is because we don't have enough word. If you don't have word, you're not gonna have faith. If you don't have faith, you're not gonna receive from God. Faith and the process of faith is what God uses to become the finisher of what he's promised for you. Unless you can align yourself with God and be convinced and convicted that that's right, you will not receive from God and that only comes through faith. So what we ended up doing is we become a double-minded person. The way that we stop being double-minded and we become totally aligned with what God wants to do is through faith. The word produces faith. If you're not receiving from God, have a look at your word intake. What's your diet like? If your diet isn't good, you're not going to have faith because faith comes from hearing the word of God. What does Psalms chapter one say? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of Marcus. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in season and whose leaf shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Paraphrased version. Blessed is the man who does not walk according to his soulish realm, but walks according to the spirit.
I've got the rest. <laughs> See what happens when you paraphrase. But his delight is in the words of God. And on God's word, he meditates day and night. On God's word, he meditates all the time. God's word, he's planting in him all the time. He will be like a tree planted by the streams of water that grow, that flourish, that become robust and produce fruit called faith. And it shall never wither. And whatever that man puts his hands to as a result of that, he will prosper in. We've become very comfortable in the natural realm. And the problem with it is, is that everything that God has and it is available to us sits in the spirit realm and is in the spirit dimension. And unless we begin to comprehend and realize the existence of the spirit realm and how to interact with that spirit realm and how to bring the world of God into an experiential reality for me, My world is dry and boring. Because I have the word, but I have no power. Because I know all the promises, I know all the goodness, I know all the things that God wants for me, but I never walk into any of them. And I end up frustrated. And very often I end up bitter and blaming God. Because I've been around for so long, and I've been so faithful, and I've done so much stuff for God but I've never learned how God operates. I've never learned the importance and the value of word because word in me produces faith and faith is the only thing that I have that's gonna take what he has available to me in the spirit dimension and bring it into a natural existence. We have to go through the passage of discovery And when you walk through that passage of discovery, you're going to learn, you're going to try, you may make mistakes, but he will be with you. Abram may have taken 30 years. It can take you a whole lot quicker because you have something that's accessible and available to you. Two things. You have the word of God and you have the spirit of God. In the place that we're going into, in the place that we want to move, it's about an understanding of the spirit dimension and the influence of the spirit dimension on who we are. (coughs) Otherwise, you've got to just do church as you've always done it. God loves you so much that he wants to bless you. And he's trying to put you in a place where he can work with you to deliver his love and his blessing and his goodness into your life. It's a good thing. 